Throughout Mayor Sam Adams' time in office, Portland has faced significant challenges, including a struggling economy, poor high school graduation rates, and persistent inequality concerns. There are, however, some signs of improvement. Unemployment rates in the Portland metro region have begun to drop below the national average, and graduation rates within the Portland Public School District have risen over the past year. Today, in his final State of the City address, Mayor Adams will discuss his efforts to tackle these key challenges that are facing our city, while also identifying the work that remains to be done to boost job creation, improve educational outcomes, and ensure equitable opportunity for all of our residents. Sam Adams first gravitated to politics as a student at the University of Oregon, where he interned in Peter DeFazio's office in Congress. He then worked for the Oregon House Democratic Campaign Committee and for the Democratic Majority Leader before successfully managing Vera Katz's first mayoral campaign in 1991. At age 29, he began the first of 11 years as the youngest mayoral chief of staff in our city's history. He won a seat at the Portland City Council table in 2004, where he was then commissioner in charge of Portland's Office of Transportation, as well as the Bureau of Environmental Services. Sam Adams was elected mayor in 2008, and we are extremely pleased to have him here today with us. And with that, please welcome Mayor Sam Adams. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Portland is an incredible place. It's a city where you can find some of the world's best music, art, food, and drink, and you don't even need a reservation. It's a place that boasts tall bikes and short lines, where you can stroll on an esplanade that floats on water, ride a tram that seems to float on air, or jump on a light rail and land in Tokyo or Amsterdam in a single day. Being such a great place has paid huge dividends. We've attracted some of the best and brightest people and retained them. Our quality of life is unparalleled. We live in an exceedingly beautiful city. What this shows is that we've done a great job of planning for and investing in Portland the place. But we haven't done the same for our even greater asset, our people. The consequence of this underaction is unacceptable. Steep high school and college dropout rates, high unemployment, deep racial disparity. Portland the place is flourishing. Portland the people are not, and that needs to change. And it is changing. In the last three years, we've been investing in jobs and equity and education as we never have before in city government. We're approaching a turning point in Portland's 167-year history. This is the moment when Portland becomes a city that's known not only for the success of our land use planning, but also for the success of all our people. I want to thank you again for the opportunity to serve you as mayor, to help lead this effort. It's been an exciting time as mayor. I am unencumbered by a re-election effort in a very long time, and truly freed to work on the changes that we need most. At the same time, everyone on the City Council is smart and dedicated and experienced and please join me in welcome in thanking and saying hello to Amanda, Dan, Nick, Randy, and LaVon. We're getting do more done than ever. My colleagues would please rise. I also want to thank the City Club and the sponsors of the Friday Forum for providing this venue again. And I'd also like to welcome some uh, special guests, including a delegation from 
congressional delegation representatives, Kendall Clausen, Scott Nelson from the governor's office, Multnomah County Chair Jeff Kogan will be joining us shortly, and we have Commissioners Kafori, Smith, and Shiprack, Clackamas County uh, Commissioner Ann Langinger, and Mayors Bemis, Kite, Hoffman, Metro Councilors Craddock and Colette, and I know I saw at least two of the 18 candidates running for mayor. I apologize if I don't know you by face yet, but I look forward to that. My staff gave me flashcards. But in the meantime, we've got Eileen Brady and we've got Charlie Hale. So give them all a round of applause. And finally, quick but heartfelt thanks to the unending support of my family, including my partner, uh, Peter Zuckerman, whose new book comes out in June. <laughs> Thanks to my mom, Kara, and my stepfather, Stuart. Uh, my grandma was uh, under the weather today, 92-year-old young Marie Gibbons, but I love you. Thank you all very much for your support. <laughs> so, turning point, you say. How is it that I know that we are at the precipice of a turning point? How do I know that Portland the people will soon be flourishing like Portland the place? I know this will happen because we have a new toolkit at our disposal and a new, new set of much needed tools. There's a good chance you've never heard of it and if you have, you may not appreciate its significance. The toolkit is called the Portland Plan. And let me draw a historic parallel so you can understand what it is and why it matters. Two generations ago, despite the stunning surrounding natural beauty of this location, Portland itself was an average city. Air pollution violations aplenty, a putrid river that ran through it, and a dying downtown. Then came Governor Tom McCall and his supporters. McCall, a Portland resident at the time, railed against, quote, sagebrush subdivisions, coastal condominia, and the ravenous rampages of suburbia. <laughs> he called on Oregonians to fight against the, quote, shameless threat to our environment and to the whole quality of life. McCall understood the challenge of his day to protect Oregon's natural environment with smart planning. He helped create and innovate statewide land use system that in 2013, next year, will be 40 years old. His efforts and the land use plan were hardly perfect or dramatic. But that land use system provided a blueprint that has withstood the raw politics and the constant turnover of public and private leadership. And it has allowed generations of leaders to build on the accomplishments of their predecessors and improve this city and our state. And as a result, Portland is one of the most desirable places in America. Now, making Portland a great place is far from finished. Just ask our sidewalk-less East Portland neighbors. But we must understand that the challenge above all other challenges of our time is to become a city that is great for all residents in addition to being a great place. The Portland plan is to people what McCall's land use plan was for place. It is a smart and accountable plan, but it's also different. It's a plan that invests in our residents. My work over the three years, which you're going to hear from me today, and all the work in the next 10 months fit under the strategic plan. And all of this work can be built by our future leaders. This is our collective call to action. The interlocking goals of the Portland Plan can be summed up with four words. Prosperous, healthy, educated, equitable. A Portland that protects what's already great about this place and improves upon the rest. The urgent needs of the past few years 
have required us to not just plan, but to act and plan at the same time. That's why we got to work early on prosperity nearly three years ago. We crafted the Portland Economic Development Strategy, the first strategy in 15 years. The strategy focuses on job creation efforts on our world-class strengths, industries with a density of living wage jobs, with the potential for growth, the most growth, like advanced manufacturing, athletic and outdoor, clean technology and software. Our strategy addresses long-standing city government dysfunction. It also, you know, requires us, has required us to look at ourselves as a city government government and address long-standing dysfunction, like creating a new housing bureau to focus only on housing and a refocused Portland Development Commission on businesses and jobs. We co-located eight far-flung permit bureaus under one roof, and we rewrote 71 sections of the city's building and planning codes to make them work even better. We also fast-tracked five years of planned public investments on job creation infrastructure projects, nearly a half a billion dollars in city capital improvement spending in two years at the worst of the recession. Not only creating jobs, but likely saving money from avoided inflation and getting cheaper bids. Getting city government out of the way of good business investments was good, but not enough. We redoubled our efforts to retain key Portland companies like Elemental Technologies, which has successfully made the leap from a small startup to a growth stage company in just five years. Recognizing the economic importance of ensuring that ele Elemental Technologies stayed in Portland, we partnered on the redevelopment with them of the Broadway Commons building downtown. We're proud to help Elemental nearly double its current workforce to over 100 employees in the next two years. Thank you, Elemental Technologies. We also, under our economic development plan, redouble our efforts to make Portland a great place to start a business. Backed by data that suggest entrepreneurial firms will create the vast majority of new jobs in the near term, Portland contributed the $700,000 to start the Portland Seed Fund for investment in the city's most promising startup firms, leveraging an additional $2.3 million in other public and private investment contributions. I'd like you to meet one of those firm founders, Sheetal Dubey. Hi, I'm Sheetal Dubey. I'm the founder of AudioName.com. AudioName is a free tool that allows people to record their name and share it with people they interact with. Two, three years back, uh, as a consultant in Minneapolis, I was giving a presentation to some of my clients, and I realized that they were trying to avoid calling my name. And it was more, I think, out of respect of not butchering it. And that's when it kind of hit me. What if, before coming to this meeting, my client could hear my name? Hi, my name is Sheetal Dubey. My name has an Indian origin, and it means cool. And would it help connect better? Would it help in the whole meeting so that we would, you know, bond better, we would relate to each other better? Or nine months back, I attended Startup Weekend where one of the judges pointed out that, you know, even though it seems like a small idea, it could have a huge impact. I was fortunate to be part of the first class of uh, Portland Seed Fund. It was a great opportunity. When I go and talk to people about, you know, audio name and the kind of support I'm getting from the community here, people are pretty surprised, firstly, because uh, they did not see that kind of a trend before. And secondly, what I'm hearing is like even people from Seattle, people from, you know, Colorado coming up and saying, you know, Portland is very hot today. Like it's very hot for technology. And I don't think that happened all of a sudden. It's really happened, I think, because of the role a lot of local entrepreneurs are playing, a lot of local incubators are playing, um, seed fund. All these different groups have kind of come together at the right time. The whole ecosystem seems to be feeding each other very well. It's a pretty cool place to actually build a company. Download Audio Name, the app from Sheila Dubey. The first eight firms have already created in less than a year 30 jobs, and just recently, 
the second round of Portland Seed Fund firms were, were selected, and somewhere they're out there. With the eight firms that are recently selected, please stand up, wherever you are. There they are. Somewhere at that table could be the next Phil Knight. <laughs> Wall Street Journal has taken note of our efforts to improve uh, startup. Uh, they quote, quote, Portland is attractive because of its friendly and collaborative culture. And it's true, we're taking that collaborative business culture, though, to the next step. And today I'm pleased to announce the creation of a tech hub in Portland Central East Side, the hub housed in the soon-to-be-renovated Convention Center Plaza building on the Birdside Bridgehead will be filled with startups from our cluster industries like uh, software and clean technology and outdoor gear. And while we're at it, from now on, the Central East Side has been rebranded as Produce Row, recognizing it as a great place for entrepreneurial ideas to grow. Sometimes a great Portland employer's headquarters are in Rivergate or Roseway or along Foster, and sometimes it's a little further away. Last year on the stage, I told you about a recent trip at that time to Spain with PDC Chair Scott Andrews. There we met with one of the world's largest renewable energy firms, Iberdrola Renewables. And last month, that visit a year or so ago paid off. Ibadrola agreed to keep its North American headquarters and its 350 well-paying jobs in Portland for the next 10 years. Thank you, Ibadrola. As I also talked about last year from the stage, that Portland must get out of the boom and bust economic cycles by becoming a scrappy yet sophisticated small global city. To do this, we must expand our exports, we must sell more goods and services to more people in more places around the world. In the last decade, even without being well organized within the region, we doubled our region's exports, putting Greater Portland on the map as the nation's second leading exporter. We intend to do better. A few weeks ago, we launched the nation's first Metro Export Initiative in the nation alongside Greater Portland, Inc., and next week, I'll be in Washington, D.C., where I'll have the honor to present it nationally with the Brookings Institution. Our Export Promotion Initiative, a coordinated regional approach, including Clark County, builds on our recent successes and calls upon us to double our exports again in the next five years. This is how we fight for jobs in the next economy. We can do this, we will do this. And that's why we've been working hard on a concept plan that is good for the environment and good for the economy on West Hayden Island. It's why we've opened a new trade office in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Por que, you say? <laughs> Sorry for the Spanish accent. As one of our partners in this project, Antonio Lombardi said, hopefully the office will still be open tomorrow, <laughs> told the Portland Business Journal, quote, there is a need in Brazil for innovative technologies and Portland can supply that. In fact, in Portland, we've been working for years to capitalize on innovative technologies and to become the clean energy hub of North America. We've carefully curated a collection of the best-in-class clean technology energy companies, retaining Vestas and Ibadrola, and recruiting uh, Swiss battery manufacturer, Revolt Technologies, Solar Power, Lucid Energy. We've talked to PGE over the years and, and grateful that they chose on their own to shut down the Boardman coal plant. We're home to the Bonneville Power Administration, one of the largest energy organizations in North America and we're working to invent the next cleanest tech building, the Oregon Sustainability Center. And we are working on another exciting clean energy recruitment underway called Columbia Biogas. Columbia Biogas is seeking to build an innovative biogas production facility in Northeast Portland in the Coley neighborhood. 
waste like commercial food scraps and grease will be diverted from our landfills and sewage systems to the plant and turned into power, enough to fuel the equivalent of 3,000 homes in Portland. Fingers crossed for luck that we can land this $55 million clean industry business headquarters here in Portland. I've said it before, I'll say it again, we will work harder than any city to keep and grow our companies. But effort alone is not enough to build a more resilient local economy that creates jobs. It takes new partnerships between business and government, and it takes a regional approach. We've never had one before, but we do now. Greater Portland, Inc., our region's new public and private economic development corporation will be home to our export efforts. Join me in recognizing its new executive director, Sean Robbins. We have a job creation plan, a smarter approach to government, new partnerships, strong regional action. But what about my pledge three years ago to create 10,000 new jobs by 2014? Still, we have much, much more work to do to bring the economy back and back in a resilient way. But today, and ahead of target, I'm grateful to report that employment is up by over 10,000 jobs in Multnomah County. We did it. And one last announcement that demonstrates that Portland is rebounding from the national recession, and this news is hot off the presses. You won't even read it in the Oregonian. <laughs> it's Portland's largest private sector only investment in years. I'm pleased today to announce that homegrown Langley Investment Properties in partnership with American Assets Trust is providing the first sneak peek at the Lloyd District Superblock project. This is a quarter billion dollar investment in the intersection of light rail and streetcar in the Lloyd District. That will include office, retail, and more than 700 rental housing it, units. It will create an estimated 3,000 construction jobs. So, do the math the city's $37 million contribution in the yet-to-be-open streetcar line has yielded a 575% return in a private investment, and the line isn't even open yet. <laughs> Scott Langley's here. Thank you, Scott, for your investment in the city. Give Scott a hug. <laughs> As we strive for a more prosperous economy and community, we recognize that a key to that success is education. No other public investment in place or people yields the positive results like a college education or an advanced skill. And nothing, nothing can bring down a city like a failure to educate the next generation of adults. When I took office in 2007, four out of 10 students did not graduate from high school on time. Using these numbers, some of the first honest high school graduation numbers of school districts across, of any school district across this nation, I campaigned to be a mayor with a promise on education, a promise to cut the high school dropout rate in half in five years. As I took office, I asked superintendents and teachers and students and parents what they needed to achieve this goal, in addition to more robust funding. We went to work on the three highest needs identified. We doubled the city's investment in eighth grade summer school called Ninth Grade Counts, because as superintendents and teachers know, a student who fails even one course during ninth grade is four times more likely to drop out of school. We created the Summer Youth Connect program 
an incredibly efficient way to connect kids that are most at risk of dropping out of high school to weekly summer college visits and visits to job sites that require college degree or skilled training. We call it the Summer Youth Connect program and we're seeing promising results. 94% of the students participating in Summer Youth Connect say they're more motivated to graduate. And with the passionate, passionate support, financial support of Portland Community College, 200 students are participating in the first year of our Future Connect Scholarship Program, scholarships that come with academic supports to help students succeed. And I want you to meet one of our fantastic Future Connect scholars, introducing Victoria Rodriguez. Hi, my name is Victoria Rodriguez. I'm 18 years old. When I was in high school, I honestly did not think I was going to be in college. My mom is the hardest working person that I know of. She tried to get a degree, but eventually she, she had to stop. Deep down, she was very disappointed that she couldn't finish. It's not the life I want to have. Once I got into my senior year of high school, I started getting on track to where, oh, maybe I can graduate high school, but nothing else. And then my guidance counselor actually told me that there was this scholarship for Future Connect. I sent in my application and, and I got the email and it was the one of the single most best feelings I'd ever had just to get that scholarship and to, to be able to know that someone actually believed in me and someone was willing to give me that chance to prove myself. Next thing I know it's you know, high school graduation and I'm doing the summer workshops for Future Connect and I'm starting the first term of college and it's, it was like su such a dream. I got to meet my success coach and she helped me so much uh, personally and academically. I really had not had that kind of support before and to have that throughout my first term when I'm just starting out, it was really, really great for me. If I can do this, I can do anything else. Because college, for a lot of people, it is hard because it's that break from the high school mentality where you just got by. But in college, you can't just get by. You have to, you have to go for it. I really am setting that trend for my family. And being the first one and then knowing, hopefully knowing, <laughs> that uh, my sister's gonna follow and graduate and go on to do what, what she feels is best for her. It's, um, it's like you're taking a, a chance to be able to be something great and if you're not willing to do that, then it's a life wasted. Victoria, where are you? Now, Victoria, I know that Janine, your mom, couldn't be with us today because she has to work, uh, but your success coach, Dara, is here. And uh, let's make this a clap uh, and applause not only for Dara, but all the great educators across this wonderful county. Dara. <laughs> Based on this early success, I'm pleased today to announce an expansion of the Future Connect Scholarship Program to include Mount Hood Community College, Portland State University, and Lewis and Clark College. <laughs> early efforts, these early efforts around educational improvement have been organized and much more into the comprehensive cradle to career improvement, education improvement strategy. In other words, a Portland for educated people. To guide this effort, we merged three organizations into a new organization called All Hands Raised. You might have known it as the Portland Schools Foundation. I want to thank Greg Cantor of Northwest Natural Gas and Sarah Mensa from the Trailblazers for co-chairing this work. And hats off to Dan Ryan and the entire team at All Hands Raised for doing the daily work of guiding what is now a countywide Cradle to Career partnership. Where are you, Dan? <laughs> 
Dan got taller and better looking. <laughs> and 20 years younger. Thank you, Nate. As the Portland Tribune put it, thanks to the work of this partnership, quote, hundreds of people doing hundreds of things made a noticeable difference in outcomes for students. And more of our students are graduating from high school on time. Despite the cuts to local school funding over the past three years, and just in Portland Public Schools alone, the cuts against current service level, I believe, are $74 million in the last three years. But despite those cuts, our most recent graduating class, the first to benefit from these years of targeted positive interventions, graduation rates rose 5% in Portland Public Schools alone. 5% after decades of being flat. Now what about my promise of having the graduation, having the uh, dropout rate um, cut in half within five years. It's probably going to take us closer to eight years than five, but we are finally making progress. We have two superintendents at least here. Would other superintendents or administrators please stand up? There's Carol Smith. I saw Superintendent Joyce. Thank you. Real progress, but we need your help to expand, and there are two things that you can do. First, host a worksite visit. We need just three hours of a Friday this summer in the afternoon to host lunch and provide a tour for 25 youth and their chaperones. Two, hire a youth for the summer, and the city council will give you a tax credit on your business license taxes that you owe for 2012. That's right. Hire a youth for summer employment, and if you owe city taxes, we'll give you a credit of $500. How many say yes? Okay, anyone with their hand? Scott Langley, thank you very much. <laughs> we should have had a paddle raise. I didn't think of everything. A visit to your business, hiring a youth for the summer will open their eyes to visualize their own brighter future a future they can have if they stay in school. Please put this item on your to-do list and there will be information that we will pass out at the doors on how you can do that. In the next 10 months, I have three more education reform items on my own to-do list. They deal with early, early learning and our public universities. One boosts elementary school critical thinking and learning the second promotes Oregon Health Sciences University, and the third will boost the nation's soon-to-be-best urban college, Portland State University. Early learning. In Portland, eight out of 10 students will complete elementary school without ever having had an arts class. No time during the school to draw or paint, no artwork to bring home to hang on the fridge. The thing is, the benefits of arts education aren't just about the arts. Years of research show that arts education is closely linked to almost everything we say we want for our children, from critical thinking to academic achievement. So this year, I will ask you to join me in supporting the Creative Advocacies Network as it seeks to establish a dedicated public fund for the arts that can restore arts and music education for every Portland Elementary School student. And while we work together to expand opportunities to our city's youngest students, we are also working to expand our city's flagship public universities, OHSU and PSU. Over the years, the City of Portland has made significant investments to support OHSU, the city's largest employer, the first business I visited after taking office the day I was sworn in as a city commissioner. Thus far, we've invested over $42 million in local funds to boost OHSU's growth as an institution. That city investment has leveraged another $119 million in other funds. And today, I'm pleased to announce that we have forged a new 
commercialization partnership with OHSU and PSU to turn academic innovations into local businesses and local jobs. And I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Jim Stott for being here today. Please accept our thanks. And speaking of Portland State University, a university with a unique urban mission to serve the city, last year I proposed on this stage the creation of a new urban renewal district, quote, focused on expanding Portland State University as a leading engine of economic growth, prosperity, and opportunity. Well, it's taken us a better part of the year to work through the details with our key partners and stakeholders, but the result is worth the effort. Today, I am pleased to announce an agreement in principle between Portland State University and Multnomah County to form an education urban renewal area. It will target the urban renewal investments to upwards of $100 million in either PSU or the university district for growth in, to educate more students, create more jobs, more affordable housing. In addition to leveraging other resources, this investment if improved by the City Council, would nearly triple the size of the University District tax base to $1.7 billion. Because a great city needs a great university, please join me in thanking PSU President Vin Vivell, who's represented by Alice, his wife, and the great Multnomah County Chair Jeff Kogan for their support of this effort. Chair Kogan. PSU is rising like a rocket, a clean technology rocket, <laughs> fueled by recycled food and <laughs> Columbia biogas. So far, we've talked about prosperity and education. We also, at the same time, under the Portland plan, seek to create a healthy and more connected city. I like to think about it in this way. It's like everyday Portland. It's the way you feel when you're going to school or work or running errands or taking a walk with your family. It's how you feel being able to say hello to the local grocer by name when you pick up produce, the neighbors that you rake leaves alongside. It's uh, our sidewalk and trees, our neighborhood main streets, our parks, our rivers, our watersheds. We want to make sure that every Portlander lives in this kind of neighborhood where they have what they need and they want to thrive. But we know that not all Portland neighborhoods have this and some are not even close, especially East Portland. And I'd like you to meet someone who's working on that with us, David Hampstead. My name is David Hampstead. I live in the Hazelwood Neighborhood Association of East Portland. I got involved because I saw a real opportunity to help the city create a much more pleasant, family-friendly walking and biking environment where people could connect to churches, to schools, to hospitals, and other public amenities, as well as to shopping, so that East Portland became more a part of Portland rather than an annexed area of Portland. The mayor had declared that East Portland would get $8 million worth of sidewalks over two years. And that really motivated both PBOT to come out here and really work with us, and it motivated the neighborhoods to really get involved with working with the city to actually create something that would help as many people as possible, especially in poorer areas. I mean, we, we have a lot of streets that just simply don't have sidewalks along major bus lines, especially along Powell Boulevard. I think people were quite happy with Mayor Adams and how he really got East Portland moving forward, especially on the East Portland in Motion project. And actually this whole project was for me an incredibly fun opportunity to get really involved with the community and work with a lot of different people. We will invest $20 million in safer sidewalks to walk on, on neighborhood bikeways to bike on, and on better access to transit in East Portland. And we will also be ready to work this summer to expand Sunday Parkways to Southwest Portland, and we will be working on the bike share program RFP for the rent-a-bike program in the next few weeks. 
Working on healthy neighborhood connections is part of our efforts to complete, to have complete neighborhoods, all of our neighborhoods, to make sure that you can meet your daily needs easily and close to home. Last uh, month, again with County Chair Jeff Kogan, we announced six more business districts in North and Northeast Portland. These focused investments bring more equity to the provision of services, services to assist businesses in every part of the city of Portland. And today I'm pleased to announce that we have secured a $1.5 million loan program from Craft 3, previously known as Shorebank, to add to our public investments. The, Ross, the Huffington Post recently pointed out that, quote, it's our cities, not the nation's capital, that are the real idea factory for our country. This is especially true regarding climate change as an issue where our national leaders seem to be paralyzed. Take composting, for example. During the, last, during the first four months of the city's new curbside composting port program, nearly 25 tons of yard debris and food scraps were diverted from the landfill. Let me put that another way. That's enough food scraps and yard debris to fill this ballroom to the ceiling 10 times. Or take Clean Energy Works Oregon, our pioneering home energy efficient uh, retrofit program. It has worked on over 1,000 homes, created 130 construction jobs, with over half going to minority and women-owned contractors. It's no wonder that Huffington Post also noted that Portland is one of the five best cities for green jobs and that we're, quote, fighting joblessness with our prime weapon, sustainability. Because of this and other efforts, we're making real progress in our ambitious climate action plan. Carbon emissions here have dropped 5% per capita in 2008. Maybe there's another major city in the world can, can claim a drop in carbon emissions in the last three years, but I don't know who they are. Thank you, Portland, for your commitment to this effort. But healthy and connected neighborhoods are not fully within reach if they're not first and foremost safe. And Portland is safer today in many ways than it has been the 1960s. That's not good enough. The Portland Bureau, Police Bureau and I surrender not one inch in any neighborhood of this city to guns, drugs, or violence gangs. That's why our reconstituted gun task force seized 205 guns in recent months, resulting in 154 felony charges, why our illegal drug impact zones also offered more than 180 clients focused drug treatment, housing, and other needed services, and why in December we arrested 31 of our most violent gang members and issued 15 federal indictments. I want to thank the men and women of the Portland Police Bureau for risking their own lives every day to keep our community safe. Chief. When I took over as police commissioner, my goal was to improve the relationship between our police bureau and all Portlanders. The relationship with the community is still not perfect, but it's getting better. Over 53% of our new hires are people of color or women. A new training center and training advisory committee to oversee those programs uh, will be on the city council agenda next week. And the New York Times recently noted, quote, that the Portland Police Bureau managed to pull off possibly the cleanest Occupy eviction in the country. <laughs> and while we face difficult budget decisions this year, I pledge to you here today, I will work with my city council colleagues to protect all sworn public safety positions in our police and fire and rescue bureaus. We're also getting our youth involved in making Portland a safer place. On April 21st, the Multnomah Youth Commission is sponsoring a first ever Youth Against Gun Violence Summit, named in honor of our beloved colleague, Rob Ingram, who passed away in November. Rob, as head of the city's Office of Youth Violence Prevention, believed in all our youth and worked every day to keep them out of gangs and in schools. Let's hear it for his wife, Dana, and the Multnomah Youth Commission. I'm almost done, I'm almost done. 
These are the fundamental components of a city that works well for its people and place. A Portland that is prosperous, educated, and healthy. And while we pursue these goals, we keep another goal front and center. For the city to succeed, all Portlanders, regardless of race, gender, sexual orientation, ability, neighborhood, age, income, or where they were born, must have access to opportunities to advance their well-being and achieve their full potential. Thanks to the work of the Coalition of the Communities of Color, NEA, ERCO, Urban League, and the Latino Network, we now know how poorly Portland is doing living up to our own equity values. We also know that creating equal opportunities is good for everyone, even those that are already have excellent access to opportunities. It's an honor and a privilege to serve on a city council that puts principle and caring for all our neighbors ahead of politics last year. That's why we adopted the transgender inclusive health policy. It's why we created the Office of Equity and Human Rights with a mission to promote equity and address disparities within city government, in our communities, and to produce measurable improvements. Now, we all know this isn't an easy issue. There's no playbook on how to effectively erase generations of disparity on a large-scale basis. But I know this is a goal that we can accomplish. And to start, city government is getting its own house in order, with the upcoming budget decisions as an opportunity to ask the two simple but tough questions. Who are we serving and how well are we really serving them? This is about changing the city's culture. That's why I'm inspired by the Regional Arts and Cultural Council for helping lead the way to ensure that all members of our community have the opportunity to connect as either a consumer or an artist. And to help lead efforts, last month, Commissioner Amanda Fritz and I announced the first director of the Office of Equity and Human Rights. He takes the Office of Equity reigns within the coming weeks, where he will work to unite our community around this common cause. He's here with us today from Denver. Welcome to Portland, Dante James. We've done a great job of planning for and investing in Portland the place, but as I've outlined today, we have much more work to do and plan to plan for and invest in the success of our people. Prosperous, healthy, educated, equitable, taken together, these four goals are the building blocks of a greater city, a Portland where all people th truly thrive. We, we recognize that there is much work to do, and I recognize that I'm in the home stretch of my term as mayor. Soon the draft plan will go to city council for its consideration, and this plan, when it goes to council, will include tough numerical goals, not just for the next 25 and 30 years, but for the next five years. And for the first time using the plan, we've gathered together transportation agencies, public safety agencies, economic development uh, departments from around the region, around the table, to talk about the business of public budgets. This isn't fun or flashy, but it's something we must do. And frankly, it's something that Portlanders expect us to do. These last three years have been exhilarating. Even during one of the worst recessions, in U.S. history. Getting such a tremendous amount done in such little time would not have been possible without a phenomenal city team. And I thank my staff and the entire city staff for their great efforts. Thank you. But well, we've laid the groundwork for a Portland that invests in place and its people and now we have a cohesive plan to do it, and we are creating a better city than we ever could have created before. There's no doubt in my mind that future leaders will perfect the Portland plan, its goals, and how it works. Here, people confront obstacles, find creative ways to meet their goals, and don't take no for an answer. Our can-do spirit, born of our native and pioneering history, reinforces as we preserve, reinforces our efforts as we preserve to make Portland what's, preserve what's great about Portland and improve the rest. 
Life is better here than almost anywhere else. This place, even on its worst days, works better than most other places. That's why we choose to live here. That's why we stay. Portland provides us with a sense of place, of purpose, and of promise. It's a promise that we can make this city even greater, and we do this by seeking to serve our people better. Portland, this is our challenge above all other challenges. We are a city that leads, a city that does things differently because we want to be better. Because we are innovators, we take risks and we take chances. Because we care about our neighbors, we want to see our youth succeed. We want all of our neighborhoods to thrive and prosper. And above all, we want everyone to share in our collective success. Portland has done great things together. And when you walk outside here today, you will see the results of that work everywhere. Every brick in Piner Square, every blade of grass in the Mount Tabor Park, every mile of streetcar and light rail track, every tree in Forest Park. And when you walk out of this room, you will also see our challenge and our potential. You will see it in the face of everyone you meet. Portland, this is our challenge and it will be our success. We will be an even greater city, a city where people thrive and prosper, and we will do this together. And as our departed friend Mark Rob Ingram would say, let's get to work. Thank you. is the Chief Marketing Officer for Schwabi Williamson and Wyatt, where she oversees the firm's client relations, marketing, public relations, and business development activities. She's been a member of City Club since 2003. Karen. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor, for sharing your uh, plan and your recap of uh, the last year. My question has to do with uh, what you would like to see happen next year. So from bike paths to curbside composting, appearances on Portlandia to Youth Connect and the plastic bag ban, you've championed as Portland's mayor. What would you like to see continued and expanded upon by your successor? Well, I think there's a, a, a great group of people running to uh, serve as, as Portland's next mayor. And I think that the, the major contribution that I, would, that I seek to make to their success has been the Portland plan, as I mentioned, and also taking on some of the chronic, maybe not so sexy uh, problems that have been around for a very long time. You know, I mentioned in the speech the uh, West Hayden Island. You know, the, the future, the, the use of West Hayden Island is, has been an open question for 20 years. Uh, Veterans Memorial Coliseum, this city council for the first time in 16 years said we're going to keep it and we're making an investment uh, to uh, renovate it as, as we responsibly should. Um, or to uh, begin to, to tackle the, the issue of unpaved roads, which in the coming months we'll be rolling out with uh, new options for financing for folks to uh, finance uh, different kinds of improved roads in their neighborhoods in the areas of the city that were most recently annexed. So it's a combination of having taken on some of the, you know, long time uh, unaddressed uh, issues or problems combined with uh, the good research and basis for moving forward, making informed decisions um, out of the Portland Plain. We'll now turn to questions from the floor. Please address your question to the mayor and identify yourself as a club member. Also, I just want to remind you that you need to uh, complete your question in under 30 seconds or you're going to see the infamous city club uh, question mark. Please. My name is Promise King, club board member. Uh, mayor, I want to thank you for your work on equity. Uh, my question is how would you rate yourself as mayor and as an equity champion? Um, I, I'm never satisfied with you know, my own performance. Um, so uh, I would say that um, 
The work is, you know, really close to my heart, and I have a great passion for it. Um, I think it's the right thing to do. Beyond that, I think Portland either is going to address our chronic racial disparity uh, that exists on all the important factors, um, or we will decline as a city. Um, you, you just can't continue to have the success that we've had in place, as I said in my speech, unless we address, um, unless we uh, come to terms with and succeed at, at the success of our people. And that's no more true than Portlanders of color. So um, I think that it's, you know, it is, it is one of the defining challenges of this city's future. Next question. Yeah. Ted Kaye, City Club member. Sam, I'd like to thank you for maintaining your membership in City Club. You're setting a positive example for your fellow political leaders. Ooh, thank you. <laughs> and my question is, what's How's your... How's Randy's membership status? How's <laughs> Randy's membership? We'll check on Randy's. <laughs> My question is, what's your prediction for the Columbia River crossing and how do you feel about what your prediction is? Um, I think the Columbia River crossing will get built and um, I think it should get built. Um, it's a difficult project, no doubt, but the efforts, you know, the goals that we set forth as a city council to make sure that it included tolls, that it included light rail, uh, that it wasn't so big that it, you know, blacktopped most of Hayden Island, that it included an arterial connection, the first arterial connection to Hayden Island in a long time, that it include adequate infrastructure for uh, bikes and peds. Um, the deal that we signed off as a city council uh, does those things. Unfortunately, I'm afraid we've run out of time for further dialogue for today, but we'd like to thank the mayor very much for your time with us and for your service to the city. And I'd ask you all to join us next week when we'll be back in here, here in this room to hear from Congressman Peter DeFazio. And as we close for the day, please join me in thanking the mayor for his time here today.